very serious time. A plague has come upon us, dear Father, like the plague of old in Egypt. But as you told your children then to seek shelter through the blood of a lamb, so now we seek shelter through the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus the Christ, your son and our savior. We are confident in your word, O God. In Exodus, you tell us, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Again, you have reminded us in Psalms 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Truly, we are in that valley. Therefore, we will not be shaken. You are our strength. You are our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our savior. There is nothing our God cannot do. All the glory belongs to you, Father. All praises belong to you. Let all the inhabitants of the earth praise your holy name. We thank and ask all blessings in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Oh, I shall not be moved. You know that I shall not, I shall not be moved. Oh, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Oh, I shall not be moved. Oh, in his love abiding, I shall not be moved. And him I'm confiding, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Oh, I shall not be moved. You know that I shall not, I shall not be moved. Oh, I, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Oh, I shall not be moved. And though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. And on the rock of ages, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Oh, I shall not be moved. You know that I shall not, I shall not be moved. Oh, I I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Oh, I shall not be, you know, you know that I, I shall not, I shall not be moved. Oh, I, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. Oh, I shall not be moved. Good morning, saints. We're thankful to the God of heaven, which doeth all things well. He once again has spared us and blessed us and allowed us to come together through this means in order to worship him in spirit and in truth, and we are eternally grateful for that privilege. We want to say thank you to those who have made this service possible via 
the internet, to our tech team, to those who work in public relationships, to our elders, uh, for having the foresight to move in this direction, uh, for all those who have contributed to us being where we are today, uh, we say we thank God. My name is Emmanuel White Sr., and I am uh, the senior minister here at the Church of Christ in Forest Hill. And it is just an humble uh, pleasure to just come to you uh, this way. We know that uh, this is different than we have been accustomed to. Our lives, all of our lives, have changed dramatically because of the current situation and circumstances. But even in the midst of crises, even in the midst of uncertainty, there's one thing that is true, and that is God is still in control. God still is good all of the time. God still deserves all of our praise and all of our adoration. Though we make adjustments in how we come to him, we still come to him as he would have us to. And so we want to invite you to study with us for just a few moments as we go into the word of God, as is our custom. We like to open with a song before we get into the word. And if you know this, we ask you to sing along with us. And let us make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Remember, he hears every word that we say Every sound that we make, he hears. So let us lift up our voice together at this time. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. To you and my hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve. All of the glory belongs to you, and all of the glory belongs to you, and all of the glory belongs to you, and all of the glory belongs to you. Amen. In times of uncertainty like we are in right now and in all of the transitions that we're having to make, sometimes the faith of those who have been serving God can be shaken. I've been attending worship services since I was two years old. My dad moved to, my late father moved to Abbeville, South Carolina and started preaching. And since I was two years old, I don't remember ever missing an opportunity to gather together with the saints. Even now, the custom and the habit of coming together is one that we look forward to. It is one that we treasure. Yes, uh, it is one that we anticipate, we're encouraged about when we have an opportunity to come together as members of his body to celebrate him, to worship his holy name, to fellowship one with another. And yet, today we have moved so far away from our norm that we may be feeling apprehensive and we may be wondering whether or not there's some violation taking place of the covenant will of God. Have we forsaken him 
in the midst of this trial that may be on your heart. I want to speak to that this morning. I want us to go to the book of St. John, the fourth chapter. And I want to read a few verses in this narrative, if you're familiar with the text. Jesus has come through the area of Samaria, and he has sent his disciples away. And while sending them away, he has an encounter with a woman at the well. This encounter is well documented. In this encounter, Jesus asks her for water to drink. In verse number seven, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Boy, I wish I had time to talk about this right now. Thirsting again from this water. But Jesus said in verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Verse 19 is getting to the point of the text today. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Our fathers, now watch this. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, talking about Mount Gerizim. Our fathers have worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You see, even during that time, the woman was confused, and the focus during that era was, where am I going to worship? I got to have a place that I must worship at. The woman said, we worship in this mountain. But Jesus said, and she said, but you all worship in Jerusalem. It's a place, it's a place. Notice Jesus said unto her in verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father, there is a day coming when you are not going to worship the Father in a mountain. You are not going to worship the Father in Jerusalem. You are not going to be focused on where you are worshiping. The focus is going to be that you worship and how you worship. Jesus said, you worship, you know not what, in verse 22. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers, true worshipers, shall worship the Father in, not at, 
in, not where. You're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. There's going to come a day, Jesus said, where it really doesn't matter where you are. It really doesn't matter what place you are at. You are going to be able to connect to the Father because the Father seeks such to worship him. And why is that, Jesus? Verse 24, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in, not at, in spirit and in, not at, truth. You need to worship God in the spirit. Now, now I know that we've been coming together a long time, and I love our coming together, but you need to know, my friend, that you are able to worship God right where you are, worship him in spirit, and worship him in truth. Now, when we look at this, there's some confusion, I think, in some of the texts that we have utilized to legalize, so to speak, the need of people coming together. One being uh, in Hebrews, I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 10, which is a familiar text, one that we are, are well well familiar with Hebrews chapter 10 and the verse is number 22 the Hebrew writer writes let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water first of all whenever we come to God whenever we come to God we need to come with him with a true heart. You need to draw near to him with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. You see, right now, our faith is being tested. Right now, our faith is under fire. The enemy wants you to believe that since you can't come to the place, you can't serve God. The enemy wants you to believe that since you are not in the right place, that you have no connection with God. But you need to know by faith we worship God in spirit and in truth. He says having our heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That is, you need to make sure that you are in alignment in your spirit with God by thinking the right way, by acting the right way, and by living the right way. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. We've gone down to the watery grave of baptism. We've come up knowing that our sins, all of our past sins, have been washed away. We come up knowing that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, that God himself has made it possible for me as a priest where I am to go before God and say, Father, I have sinned against you and before heaven, and God Almighty, through Jesus Christ, will forgive. And so he says in verse number 23, so let us hold fast then the profession of our faith. You need to hold. This is the time, church, that we need to hold fast on what we believe and make sure our hope does not waver. Hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. You can't waver now. You can't look at the circumstances going around you and determine that God is not in control. You need to hold fast to the profession of our faith and don't waver because he who promised, uh -huh, he who promised, God Almighty who promised is faithful. He's faithful. You don't have to worry about whether or not God can do what he says he's going to do. You don't have to worry whether or not God can handle a crisis. I remember God has handled all kind of crises throughout the world. There is nothing that escapes him. He is in full control, and the promises that he made to his children, he is going to keep. Then he says in verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together 
as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake, he says, the assembling of ourselves together. Here we are on the day of our Lord in March on the 28th day of our Lord or 29th day of our Lord and we are not coming together. We are not assembling ourselves together as the matter is. How do we reconcile then the scriptures saying don't forsake the assembly and we are not assembling? Well, first of all, let me say to you that the word forsake means that we are disallowing, we are not participating, we are ignoring, we are, our absenteeism is because we have a lack of care and concern for what is going on in the body. Don't forsake. We have not forsaken. Let me say to you, to all of you who are listening right now, we are not not coming together because the government has said you cannot worship God anymore. We are not not coming together. We are not assembling at this time because the government has said you are forbidden and it's illegal for you to congregate as a group of people serving God. The government has said to all groups everywhere, whether you group on your job, whether you group at the gym, whether you group over here, we don't want any groups coming together. And the leadership has acknowledged that in the best interest of the community, we are not coming together at this time. And if the government ever said that it is illegal for us to worship God, I'll be the first person going to jail because I will stand up and continue to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to know, my friends, that we are complying with spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership is what we're complying with. We are complying with what thus saith the Lord by the giving of men who have oversee over the body. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 17, obey them. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 17 says, obey them that have the rule over you. Obey them that have leadership over you. Obey them that have oversight over you. And why is that? And you need to submit to them. Why? For they watch over your souls. They watch over your life. Every leader across this country right now who loves the Lord has had to make an agonizing decision. Do we worship and bring our people together and endanger them possibly? Or do we find another way to keep connecting to our people and making sure that they are still accounted for, making sure that we are watching over their souls, we're watching over their life, and we have to give an account. And let it be a joyful task for them. Stop talking about the leaders who are trying to lead you through crises. Stop being negative toward the folk who are trying to guide you through a crisis. Nobody has all the answers right now. We are in uncharted territory for us. Not as a sad one, for that would be unprofitable to you. So what are we saying? Listen, 
I know we are not assembling, but that does not mean we are not worshiping. I know we are not assembling, but that does not mean that we are not serving God. We are serving God because we are worshiping him, how? In our spirit. Your spirit, my spirit, our spirit is able to connect to God and wherever you are, wherever you are, you are able to worship God by your focus on him right now. You're doing it in spirit and you're doing it according to truth. Let me say one other thing to you. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, John, that John who wrote what we read in St. John, that John who wrote in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the same was in the beginning with God. That John who said that the Word became flesh in John 1 and 14 wrote a letter. And the Bible says in Revelations chapter 1 and verse number 9, he says, I, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, I'm this John. He says, was in the isle that is called Patmos. John is in the isle or on a place called Patmos. John is in a place. He's at a place. He is not with the people of God. He has been banished because of the preaching of the word, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says in verse number 10, I, John, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Where are you, John? Well, I'm on the Isle of Patmos. But what are you doing on the Isle, John? Well, I am in the spirit. But what about the saints? Well, I pray they are in the spirit because where I am, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day. And while being in the spirit on the Lord's day, he says, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, the first and the last. John was worshiping God all by himself on the Lord's day, on an aisle, away from the people of God, and he was worshiping all by himself. See, my friends, worship right now is not about the place. It's about the person. It's about, it's about who you are in Christ Jesus. One other point I want to make while I'm here. And we're talking about worshiping God, worshiping God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as Paul gives this discourse about uh, the oneness of the Spirit, he starts in verse number 14 saying, for the body is not one member. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, the body is not one member, but many. The body is not made up of one member, but many members. It says, now if the foot shall say, because I am not the, the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not part of the body? He goes on to say, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the ear, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, watch this, yet one body. We are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. 
And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow a more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which, which lacked. Verse 25, that there should be no chism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Verse 27, now you are, you are the body of Christ. The building that I'm in right now is not the body of Christ. The place where I'm standing is not the body of Christ. I am a part of the body of Christ. You are a part of the body of Christ and individual members in the body. So wherever you are, worship your God. Wherever you are, worship your God. Wherever you are sitting, whether you're in the nursing home, whether you're in the jail, worship your God. Whether you're confined to your home, whether you're in a hospital bed, worship your God. He is worthy to be worshipped. Worshiping God is an act where God has given us a part of himself, his spirit, and he expects us to commune with him. Because God is a spirit, we're able to commune with him wherever he is. Because our God is a living God. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. Do not sit at home guilty, my friends, because you cannot come together. Do not worry at this time. Now, when the leadership says, and, and they say it's safe for us to congregate again, I'll be the first one to say, let's get down here at 3916 Forest Hill Circle at 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. or 845, whenever they say gather, so we can worship our God in spirit and in truth. And if you stay home then, you'll be forsaken, the planned assembly. But nobody is planning on gathering right now so you are not forsaken in assembly. You are following the instructions of the leadership who is following the lead of the government and listening to God Almighty. May God bless you as I pray as we meditate on his word. I trust that I've said something to encourage you, to help you to understand how to be at peace where you are in this moment of crises. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Before we do, I want to give anyone an opportunity as a royal priest to get things right between them and God. If you've sinned in a way that has brought shame on God and you're a member of his body, this is the time to acknowledge it. Learn how to talk to God and tell him. Tell him what you've done. Tell him about your thoughts that have not been right. Tell him about your words that were spoken unkindly. And acknowledge that and repent of those things that you know you've done. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, we invite you to become a part of God's spiritual family. You come by first hearing the good news that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that constitutes what we call the gospel. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay that except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Confess him as Lord, Romans 10 and 10, and be willing to go down to watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38, and you will rise and be a child of God. If you have that desire, we ask you to contact us, and we will make sure that we get you into the water where your sins will be washed away as soon as possible. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the power of your word. Thank you, Father, for the clarity in your word. May we as your children hold fast to the relationship that we forged long, long ago, and may we not be limited in our relationship based on place, based on location. May we learn 
how to reverence you wherever we are, honor you and worship you wherever we are. And we thank you for your son, which makes this possible, for your spirit, which guides us and communicates for us in areas that we don't know how. We thank you for your great love, and we ask this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we want to transition to a very important part of what coming together is all about, and that is in giving of our Lord to, to give so that the work of the Lord can continue. You want to know that you are able to give uh, according to as you have prospered. God should come first. There are ways that you can give. You can give online. Uh, you can come by and drop it off if you need to, but you can go to our website, fhcoc.org, and you can go there to the tab. It's on the screen at this time, and you are able to give. Uh, we ask you to give so that the work of the Lord uh, can continue. Amen. Let us give thanks for the offering that is coming in, Father. We thank you for still supplying our needs. We thank you, Father, for the promise that you've made that we don't have to worry about what we're going to eat or where we're going to stay, that you know we need these things. But you've made provisions to take care of us. And so, Father, we are seeking you, but we are thankful for the opportunity we have to give to you because we know we can't beat you giving. So thank you, Father, for your greatest gift, and that is your son, Jesus. We ask that we use these monies in a way that will bring glory to your name and help your people in Jesus' name. Amen. And we thank you for that offering. At this time, we want to give you opportunity to commune. Those of you who are part of our family, if you've come by and picking up items for communion, uh, we want to give you that opportunity to do so at this time. The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, is where we get our example for the communion. Paul writes, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. It's the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. At this time, we ask for you to take the emblem of the bread, which represents his body, and may we partake of that at this time. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your body and for your blood. We thank you for the great sacrifice. We thank you for the opportunity to remember that as long as we continue this, that your promises will stand fast. God, help us as we trust you in this time. We thank you for the opportunity to commune with you wherever we are, in Jesus' name, amen. We've had the opportunity to commune and give, and we have reflected on the word. At this time, we want to thank you again for being a part of our service. We hope you've been encouraged. We're going to be led in a closing song by Brother Eric Patterson. And we will be given a closing word of prayer by our elder, Brother Roy Watley. I want to also thank our elder, John Flanoy, for praying earlier. At this time, uh, we ask you to join in song as we prepare to conclude our service. Brother Patterson. Let the church sing, amen. Let the church sing, amen. And amen, amen. Let 
the church sing amen. Let the church sing amen. Let the church sing amen. Let the These things I have spoken to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, again we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. Thank you for those who are here today. We thank we thank you for Brother White as he preached the unadulterated scripture. Bless those, Father, who are grieved and sick at this time. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us as we continue our walk with you. We realize that the world is going through some troublesome times, but we know you hold the whole world. We are thankful that we are your children, and that you are our God. As we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence, we pray that you will guide, guard, and protect us until we assemble again. In Jesus' name we pray. 